I want to talk to you specifically about turning, turning pressure into power. Some things that God's really, really talked to me about, about how to dig out the kind of substance of the Holy Spirit that's on the inside of us, every one of us, how to dig it out so that there's really something that, that is happening when we're under pressure and that the power of God in our life is not just, is not just a theory, it's not just a doctrine, man, it's an experience. And I saw some things as I started going down this track and the Holy Spirit started helping me with it. I started to think in terms of all of the heroes scripturally that we have. There's so many big names in the Bible. Great men and women that just do big things for God. And how these people, people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those kind, David, the, uh, the prophets, uh, even Peter, James, John, these these are, the, these are the big names of the Bible. People like the Apostle Paul, they, they each one faced some very pressure situations. I mean, you read through Scripture, and there is some major things that happened to these people. And, uh, and they seem to go through these things in, in a lot of cases. A lot of these people seem to go through these things with a great deal of ease. It's like you read about the pressure they're under, and then... All of a sudden, man, they just say and do something that, whoop, man, it's all over and the power of God shows up and it's like, it's like uh, do I have that? Is, do, do I today have what they had in that event? And uh, the thing that really got my attention in this and is the Apostle Paul right there at the end of the book of Acts. And we don't have to read it, but you remember the story. He's getting free transportation via the Roman government to go preach. Uh, and of course it was, it was free, but it was not good. It was chained to the belly of the ship uh, as a prisoner. But he was as a prisoner getting his free transportation to go minister. And this ship got out into the high seas of, uh, and, and a hurricane hits. And man, they're in trouble. And the, the Lord had told Paul this was going to happen. And uh, that God would deliver them, which he did, but it was a mess. And when they, this ship finally drifted up onto the island of Malta, all of the people on, sh on board the ship got off onto the island and they were safe. But while they were there, Paul gathering sticks to build a fire, it tells us, has a viper come out and latch onto him and bite him. Now, the tribes people that probably watched all this happen may have thought that these people delivered from this terrible storm were like people the gods were happy with. But now this is one, Paul. He's one that apparently the gods are not happy with. Man, they're killing him. And uh, he gets bit. But then what does he do when he gets bit? He shakes it off. <laughs> man, there is nothing more fun than being in where I stand right now and preaching all day long on shaking it off. I think you ought to announce it right now. Just shake it off. There's some things right now today you could probably just shake off. And uh, Paul just shook it off. And while those tribes people may have thought the gods were angry at this one, they waited for him to die. He didn't puff up and die. No, he was delivered. Praise God. Because he just shook it off. He didn't die. And now no doubt the tribes people thought the gods were not angry at him, that this actually was a god himself, you know, and, which is just a testimony to how fickle people really are. And uh, even today, you don't have to be one of those tribes people, whatever tribe you're in. People are fickle in that tribe too. That's another message. Be a good one though. Paul just shook it off. Say it out loud. I'm shaking it off too. Now, that's not my message today either, but it would be a good one. You got to just shake it off. What did Paul do? He gets bit by a poisonous snake, and he just shakes it off. So is that, is that the way it goes for you when something happens? You just instantly, it just, you've got all that it takes to just shake it off. Wham, man, that's no big deal to me. Viper, snake, hurricanes. You just shake it. Is that how it goes for you? I, I don't always seem to have the ease that it seemed like Paul had. Man, I'm feeling lonely right now. You seem so holy, you early morning Christian you. 
Man, we face stuff and it doesn't always hit us like instantly that we have every answer and every, every ability to just shake it off. And yet that's really what God tells us we can do. And so what I want to do today is I want to look through how Paul said it went for him. Not just in that specific event, but just in general, man, when things, when things come, when things happen, what's going on inside of Paul and what is there about that that can happen inside of me? I'm a real how-to guy, man. I need real details. I don't need theories and I don't just need to hear how good it went for you, man. I need, I mean, I'm happy for you, but I want to know how it's going to go good for me. And I need real how-tos. I need pictures. I was a real picture. I, need, I, I was a comic book kid. I need pictures along with it. I mean, I was a Cub Scout, you know, and it was, it was a short, short thing, but Cub Scouts were big on knots. It was short for me because I got in a fight with the den mother's son and I was out. <laughs> but in my short career as a little Cub Scout, I realized these guys are really serious about knots. You got to be able to tie all kinds of knots. And I knew how to tie a granny knot, but that seemed, that seemed embarrassing to even announce. You know, I've, the only knot I've got is one that grannies tie. And uh, so, but then the little bear book that I had, I was trying to become a bear as a Cub Scout. Remember, how many, doesn't matter. Uh, but they had diagrams and Take the, for knots, man, this was so helpful because there were pictures involved. I needed demonstration and pictures and Lord, if there had been YouTube videos in those days, it would have been magnificent. And I would know many more knots than I do today. I've really regressed back to merely the granny knot at this stage in my life, which since I'm a grandpa, maybe there's some kind of thing okay about that. Paul gives us some detail as to how it goes, and that's what I want to go through in the book of 2 Corinthians with you. So I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians if you brought your Bible. If you didn't, I know we have it electronically for the lazy. And uh, <laughs> Or the ones that didn't bring their Bible, whichever category you fit in. 2 Corinthians, first chapter. Because here's how Paul goes at it in verse 8. He said, we do not want you ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. That is like a shocking statement, honestly, to hear somebody like the Apostle Paul actually, actually describe. When he was facing, I mean, you can't, you can't twist this around very many ways. When he was facing trouble, the trouble he was in in Asia, whatever he's referring to specifically, had to be pretty, pretty heavy and big trouble. He said it was, it was a burden beyond measure, above strength. In other words, he didn't, he didn't think he had the strength to get to the other side of this and that it was not going to end well. Now, you see, I can identify with that. That's what seems to come first before the idea of shaking it off. The trouble comes and he said, we despaired even of life. Then verse 9, he said, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. This really is not going well. But then watch how he shifts this. He said, we had the sense of death in ourselves. So we're not trusting ourselves." but we're trusting in God who raises the dead. He didn't even let that sense of heaviness, beyond strength, above measure, settle in, but he reminded himself that I'm not the guy that turns all this around. I can't do this on my own. Now, I can identify with feeling that way. And he said, but we keep our trust where it belongs. It belongs in the God who raises even the dead. When it looks like this report is not going to turn out well, that you're going down for the last time, here's how he said it. He said, but even that doesn't necessarily mean it's over. 
because we believe in a God of resurrection power. Now, I like that. And that's where this power starts to rise up in us even when we're facing trouble that's beyond our measure, beyond what we feel we can handle, beyond our strength. We've all been in those situations, man. I don't need a show of hands. You have faced some things where the reports have come or the feelings have come or the issues and situations have developed where it doesn't feel like there's really a way out. And I don't have what it takes anymore, man. I'm up to here. I'm done. Well, if you hadn't felt that way, I'll just tell you I have. I'm done. And you know, if you stay in that zone for long, it starts to make sense to you. It starts to sound like a viable option for you to just go ahead and lay it down when God wants you to pick it up and rise up even out of the biggest trouble you've ever faced. See, we're in a society and in a time frame when there are a variety of troubles, lots of things going on. There's a variety of things. We get daily, minute by minute sometimes, information of things that you should worry about, things that are not good. They're going on around us. Some of them then are going on in us. I mean, if you are a high-level worrier, and some people are, I mean, some people just are the worrying type. Others are not, but anybody can be. And if you are the high-level worrier type, I mean, the kind that will worry over people that are not worrying enough. <laughs> you know, this is what family does for you. They'll worry over you now that you love Jesus, have all this faith and all these positive points in your life. They're worried. Yeah, they're worried. You're, you're, you're not in touch with reality anymore, man. You've gone off the deep end. And they're worried because you don't seem to have sense enough to worry. And every mother feels, or not every mother, but many mothers feel like a certain amount of worry must go on. And if you're not keeping up, they'll actually put in worry time on your behalf so that your, your worry monitor is, is not falling short. And if you're the worrying kind, I mean, these are great days for you, frankly. There are so many options of things to worry about. You know, you can worry about the politics, which is not worth worrying about. You can worry about the direction of America, but God's got his hand on America. We play our part, but uh, now you, you can't do it out of fear and worry. But if you're out of things to worry about, you could always worry about how it is they found the remnant of pharmaceutical drugs in the ice of Antarctica. Now, that would be an interesting thing to waste your time worrying about. And that's really all it is. It is a waste of time because uh, you understand why. Anyway, I'm not going to go down all the reasons, but uh, there's all kinds of information that hits us, these various reports, and they come to drain the, the strength right out of us. But a lot of it seems to have some real pertinent, pertinent impact in our life. Things that are very personal, that if you don't get your head in the right place, man, it starts to drain the strength right out of you. Paul said, here's what I, I do. He said, I realized that, reminded myself that you don't trust in yourself, you trust in God, you keep your trust where it belongs. And he said, our trust remains in the God who has delivered us. This is the next verse. He has delivered us. Say it out loud. He has delivered me. He does deliver me. And he will continue to deliver me. That's what Paul continued to remind himself of. And that is the first thing that we remind ourselves of. When a report comes of one type or another, when you're facing something that is just more than you can take right now, Say, yeah, but God has delivered me in the past. He's my deliverer now, and he will deliver me in the days ahead. Amen. Glory to God. Say it out loud. He delivers me too. He delivers me and he does. But remember, we are how-to people. At least I know I am. I think you may be also. He not only has delivered us, but I want some details as to how this really comes about. It's not just by ignoring things. It's not by pretending nothing's going on. It's not by getting into denial. Faith, living by faith in the Word is not about denial. We're not denying that these things are happening. We're just denying that they can, can continue in the way they're going in our life. 
And so Paul gives us some better or some, some more detail later on in this book. Drop down to chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians. And from here on, pretty much, I want to use the Passion Translation because there's some terminologies here that I really want to land on that grabbed me when I, when I saw it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the first verse said, Now, it's because of God's mercy that we've been entrusted with the privilege of this new covenant ministry. Now watch this line. And we will not quit or faint with weariness. There's the game that Satan wants to play. He's trying to play it on Paul, and he tries to play it on you. Something that will just wear you out. Weariness. And Paul said regarding ministry, but this isn't just about ministry only. This is about whatever the situation is in your life. We are not going to quit, nor let weariness cause us to faint. Paul gives us even more detail as to this. Drop down to verse 6. It says, For God, who said, Let brilliant light shine out of darkness. That's that reference to Genesis and creation. He is the one who has cascaded his light into us, the brilliant light, dawning light of his glorious knowledge of God as we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ. That's a lot of words just to say that there is a knowledge that has brought divine light that has already been imparted into you as a believer. You've already got this. Say it out loud, I've already got this. We have the knowledge of God imparted to us in our inner man. There's a knowing. There's a substance of the Spirit. You've been born of the Spirit of God. This is where it's important to realize that we really are triune beings made in God's image and likeness, three parts. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. And when you are born of the Spirit of God, God has imparted this divine energy, light, knowledge of His glory right on the inside of you in that spiritual birth, being born from above. Glory to God. So what's real in heaven now is real in earth because it is real in you. Amen. Glory to God, man. This cranks me up. But we don't always feel the evidence of this great knowledge really filtering into the way we're seeing things and our emotions. Not when the squeeze is on. Our head gets wrapped up. Our emotions get all ignited over the wrong things and it, it really distances us. It misaligns us. It takes the alignment away from the power of God that's on the inside of us and it really doesn't, it really doesn't flow all that well into into our thinking or maybe even into our body. Man, we, we let the misalignment of, of what's real in the spirit impact and change what we can ac access and have happen in our soul and in our body. And it happens because we allow our weariness or misinformation to, to take over. Are you following me today? Yeah. All right, just checking. So let's get some more detail. He gives us some other ideas in the very next verse. And this is where he really gets into it. He said, for we're like common clay jars. Do you ever feel common? All right, I'm going to say it this way. There are times you feel common. I'm not going to wait for you. There are times that you feel like a common. I know you're mesmerized by the depth of what we're doing. Uh, but we're like common clay jars, just regular folks. That's, that's what we are. That's who we are, but we are not just regular folks. We have, we have a deposit of God that takes us out of being just common people anymore. We're not just regular folks, man. We are full of Jesus. We're the real Jesus people of this day. Oh, glory to God, you Jesus freak, you. That's what they used to call me when I got saved in the 70s. It was, it was Jesus 
movement time and major move of God and all the, or a lot of stoners like me were giving our lives to Jesus. And I was just a long hair stoner type dope fiend traveling the universe and uh, <laughs> looking for the edges and trying to find light out in darkness. It's crazy. Anyway. But of this day, we are the, the true, real Jesus people because he dwells in us. It's all about Jesus. It's not just about church. It's not about just showing up, man. It's, it's about Jesus, that he's Lord, that he's empowering me, that he's everything to me, and that he is the number one authority and influence of my life. Glory to God. Isn't that what it's all about for us? That's what makes us Jesus people. Now look, if it's not all about that for you, you're in the right place at the right time because in an instant, bam, it can become that for you too right now. You just say, Jesus, I want you. I need you. I've got to have you. I, things have to turn around in my life. This is the moment. You just, you just make that choice right now and bam, you, you change. Power of God's here for that. I want you to do it right now. But here's what he says about us as common clay jars who are not all that common. He says, we're just common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure. Said out loud, I carry the treasure. And he said, here's what happens with this treasure so that the extraordinary overflow of power can be seen and be seen to be of God. God wants his influence and his power to be seen, and he wants it seen in you, in your victories, in your ability to rise up when things go dark, in your power to stay on track and on course with who Jesus is, even when you're getting the kind of reports that contradict the promise of God. You have the capacity to stay on track and on course because of the power of God that's in you. It separates us. It does make us different. We're not who we used to be. We don't cave like we once did. And even if we stumble and fall, we know how to rise up in the power of God again. When we're facing trouble, where it feels beyond measure, this is how we deal with it. That though we have the pressure come, we're not common people. I mean, we are, but we're not. We look like everybody else, but man, we got the power, extraordinary power on the inside. We are never left to do it alone. That's what he says here next. Watch this, that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's and not ours. Verse eight, though we experience every kind of pressure. So the Christian life doesn't exempt us from the pressure. As a matter of fact, in some cases, it feels like it enhances the pressure. It even gets stronger. There's even more of it in more directions. There's the pressure to actually do what you say you believe. Whoa. There's the pressure. <laughs> we actually got to live in this. We can't just talk it. We, we need, it has to be happening. He said, though we experience every kind of pressure, even trouble of the highest level. He said, we experience the pressure but we're not crushed. Say it out loud, I'm not crushed either. I'm not crushed. He said at times we don't know what to do. That's amazing that Paul's the guy saying this. Because you think some of these people, they, they, always, they always know exactly what to do. They always have the right thing. to They always have what it takes. Now, that's not what he said. Now, it looks that way when you watch them from the outside. You just shake it off. Man, he knows to do that. Look at that, man. He just shakes it off. He just speaks to the wind. He just rides out the hurricane. He's fine. What a guy. But he said, when we're under pressure, we have to handle it. At times we don't know what to do, but here's what we know. We know that quitting is not an option. Glory to God. Say, quitting's not an option for me either. On that point, man, I, I had the privilege a number of years ago. Actually, it was in 1982. I was able to travel for about three weeks with Dr. Lester Summerall, a great apostle of God. He's in heaven now, but he was celebrating in 1982 his 50th year of ministry. And on this 50th year of ministry, he was taking a, 
a, a trip through the Orient through to some places that he had actually either established a church or he had had influence and had ministry time. And so it was going to be an amazing trip, and I was able to go. And it was an amazing trip. I could take all the rest of the time telling you all kinds of great stories. But this is, this is what I want you to, to realize from this great old apostle. One of the guys on this trip, another young guy like me at the time, and he asked Dr. Summer, he said, so Dr. Summer, what is the key to longevity in ministry? You've been doing this for 50 years. What is the key that you have found to longevity? And then we were just like little birds with our mouth open waiting for morsels to come from this great old apostle. And what are the keys? Oh man, this is going to be an amazing revelation and moment. And he didn't hesitate really at all. He just, in, in real typical summer all fashion, he kind of barked a little answer to us. He said, I didn't quit. <laughs> that was it. That was the total package of his answer. Oh, okay, I get it. You don't quit, you're there a long time. 50 years now for him. It went longer than that even. If you don't quit, you're still in. Amen. Said out loud, I'm still in too. I'm still in too. Uh, we're not quitters. Now you can feel like it, you can want to, you can feel like it's over, you're done. I'm tired of this, I'm not gonna put up with it anymore, I'm out. But then the Spirit of God rises back up in you and he reminds you that even when you don't know what to do or what's going to change your situation, quitting is just not an option. Say it out loud, quitting's not an option for me either. He said, we don't know what to do, but quitting's not an option. Verse 9, we're persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. Say it, I'm not alone either. We may be knocked down, but we're not out said, I'm not out either. These are the things that Paul would stir up inside of him. And here's how he did it. Drop down to verse 13. He tells us how, how you do that too. He said, we have the same spirit of faith that is described in Scripture when it says, first I believed, then I spoke in faith. He says this, he said, so we also first believe and then we speak in faith. What you believe counts. It really matters. That's why we keep studying and having times and we have to be people of the word that our believing is really correct and it's right. Do you believe you're right in what you believe? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that was pathetic. But we believe... <laughs> that was harsh. But, uh, but true. We believe that we're right, but we're ready to... Find out where we're wrong. Are you ready to find out where you're wrong? Yeah. All right, that was better. But, uh, but we believe and we keep studying and digging and letting the Holy Spirit help us and teach us. That's why coming to this church, I mean, it, it, it's, it's amazing because this ministry teaches in such a powerful, clear way and has for all these decades. I just love listening to Mac and, uh, and Lynn both. I mean, it's just amazing. And I know there's others here that also just as clear about it, but it's about learning these things, discovering it. He said, we first believe, but it's not enough that we believe right. You got to follow it all the way through because we not only believe, but we also speak it. Amen. There's power in your words. There's a release of things from God and this ongoing speaking in harmony and in, in the light of what you believe is vital. And not just when you're in church, man. I mean, when any kind of information comes, you, you let your meditation of the Word and what you've learned become the filter of what comes into you and you speak, either according to the information you receive or you speak to contradict the information that has come to undermine what you've believed. I mean, at times like this, even around here right now, you're, gonna, you're getting information on a regular basis, man. It's flu season again. And the announcements come. And oh, man, some people take the announcements so serious, man. They buy new pajamas. They, uh, <laughs> they load up the medicine cabinet. They try to figure out because flu season, you know, well, Dennis, I get it every year. Every year it comes, man, I end up with the flu. So you believe and you speak. 
And it works year after year after year, man. You are living proof. We say we believe what God said, but we then say and do things that are so contrary to it. Paul says we believe, but then we also speak. I just announce it when it's announced to me. Flu season is here. Yeah, but it doesn't come to my house. I resist it in the name of Jesus. Yeah, but what if you get it? Well, I just wear old pajamas. Just get over it, you know? It's like we keep applying the word. What if, what if I don't? I don't have it now. It's working right now. Anyway, that's another message also. We could go all day. But uh, watch this. Wait, I want to read something to you. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 from the Phillips translation. I didn't tell the, the sound guys and the, the, the people that put it up on the board, but uh, here's what it says, Romans 12, 2. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your mind from within. Ooh, I love that. Don't, don't let the squeeze change you. You change the squeeze. And instead of being the one under the pressure, now you're the one applying the pressure even to the reports in the kingdom of darkness itself. But he goes on even further there in 2 Corinthians. Let's drop down to verse number 18. He says, we don't focus. This is more of how you do this stuff in dealing with the pressure. He said, we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. That's one of the strangest but most powerful statements in the kingdom to understand how to live it out when you're the one under pressure and when trouble comes. He said if you, if you see it or feel it, he said don't focus on that. Yeah, oh, Dennis, but that just sounds like denial. Well, you're wrong. It's not about denial. Like I mentioned a moment ago, it's not about denying that it's there. It's about denying that it has the right to continue. We see it for what it is. It's a strategy. It's an approach. It's an effort to undermine things, but I'm not going to let it remain. So instead of focusing on that and continuing to feed the worry or feed the fear... We stir up all of those resources of God's light within us and we push back and we put the squeeze on what's come to squeeze us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we don't focus on what you can see or what you feel, but you focus on what's eternal, Amen. what power God has placed in you, that light, that substance, and you stir it up. How do you do it? Well, we already read it. You stir it up by declaring it by putting your word to it. No, I don't, I don't tolerate, I'm not going to tolerate myself getting dark and depressed and upset over what I just heard. I feel it. I don't like it. I, I don't like what I just heard. I don't feel right about it. But you know what? I don't want to feel like I feel right now, so I am pushing back. Amen. And I'm releasing my faith now. I stir up the life and love and, and all of that energy of the Holy Spirit within me to push back on darkness. That's tried to settle in. I mean, you just do it. You just say it. You just stir it up. And it really works. It really does something. Let me give you just a little bit more. Can you take just a little bit more? Drop down to chapter 12, still in 2 Corinthians, and Paul gives us even more light. And this is really what grabbed my attention, and one of the main reasons I'm using the, the Passion Translation is to really focus on on some statements he makes here in this section. So I want you to see it. We'll start in verse 7, chapter 12, verse 7. He said, The extraordinary level of revelations I've received is no reason for anyone to exalt me. Now watch this. But this is why a thorn in my flesh was given to me. There it is, the thorn in the flesh that was given to Paul. And there's been so much controversy over this and so many crazy things said. But here, Paul's real clear about what this is, a thorn in the flesh given to me. And he tells us what that thorn is exactly. The adversary's messenger. All right, just for clarity, who is the adversary? Satan, Satan himself. Satan has sent a messenger 
to Paul because of the revelations that Paul has received. This didn't come from God. It didn't come to bless Paul. It didn't come to help him out. It didn't come to clarify things for him. This was a messenger of Satan that was sent, he says here, to harass me, not to help me. A messenger of Satan. And when you receive revelation and input from God, the same thing ends up happening to you too. There is, there is a strategy of hell to undermine you continuing to walk in what you've received. If Satan can't drag your soul to hell, the best he can do is give you hell here now. And you cave into it and go ahead and, and live that. Because you're going to heaven. Say it out loud, I'm going to heaven. But the Doobie brothers were wrong, man. You don't have to go through hell to get to heaven. All right, a little flashback, sorry. But uh, <laughs> yeah, who are the Doobie brothers? If you don't know, it's, it's, it's sad, but you don't need to. But here's what he does say about this adversary's messenger. He said, three times I pled with the Lord to relieve me of this. Now that's something I would do too. God, get this off of me. I don't know what, he start, what the harassment was for him, but man, I'm, when I face stuff, God, get this off of me. Three times he cried out to God, God, get this off of me. And the Lord came back and had something very clear to say to him and listen to what he said. He said, my grace is always more than enough for you. And my power finds its full expression, watch this, finds its full expression through your weaknesses. Now listen, this is, this is what he did not say. He did not say, after Paul said, get this off of me, God said, no, you got to keep this because your weakness is what really blesses me. God did not say that. God didn't say, no, you have to keep this because it's going to make you better. No, God didn't say that. He said, my grace is enough so that my power is revealed even in this weakness that's in your life. It's all about coming out of this pressure cooker situation. And he said, my grace is what does it. And the expression comes and reveals my power through you in this deal that you're in. So he goes on and he says this. He said, so I'm celebrating my weaknesses. You see, we get embarrassed. We don't want to admit our weaknesses. And granted, a lot of what I go through is none of your business and I'm not about to tell you now. So that's fine. But the real deal is that everybody faces things no matter how long they've been walking with Jesus. And here, Paul himself, the guy with the great kind of revelations that just flip our switch, he said, he had them too. And here's what God said, I'm going to take these weaknesses and I'm going to turn it around and, re and I'm going to reveal my power. Amen. So Paul said, I'm celebrating what, what I'm in. Not depressed by it. I don't like it. But I'm not going down with it. I believe in a God that raises the dead. I'm going up. And here's how he said it would happen. He said, for when I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So now watch verse 10. This is why we've done all this for verse 10. He said, so I'm not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger. Said out loud, I'm made stronger too. Now watch this last line, man. This one just, this is what got me. He said, for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Amen. Glory to God. Oh man, it is the entry point that God said, when you identify it, when you don't play with it, but when you call it what it is, it is a weakness that I am laying hold on power from God that is born within to deal with, he said that becomes the portal. The divine energy of God is unlocked from the treasure within you. We don't have to wait for heaven to come do something else, man. Heaven has already put in you what it takes so that whatever weakness Satan has tried to point out to you and grab you with, 
has no further ability to control my life or yours. It became a portal of power. Glory to God! Now, I want you to stand with me, and I want us to take hold of something. Now, I'm not done yet, so don't get in a hurry. But I want you to be upstanding while we lay hold on this personally. Because this is real power. This is not just preaching. This is not just theory, man. This is, this is how Paul said the power of God really is released in us. We're not ashamed and we're not, we're not embarrassed by weakness in our life, but we are delighted that God is about to show his power in this place in your life. Lift your hand right before God. Say it out loud, O oh God. I believe you are Lord of all. And your light dwells in me. The knowledge of glory. And it dwells in me to push back on weakness. The pressure that I've come under today. That point of weakness has no right to remain. In the name of Jesus, I release power. That divine, extraordinary power that dwells in me now, I release it into my soul, into my body, into my family, and into my finances. That in Jesus' name, God's glory can be seen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a day for there to be new power in your life. You're walking out of this place different than you walked in. I believe that's how this happens. It's in theory, man. This is how that divine energy, that treasure within opens wide, comes right out of your innermost being because that's where the power of God resides. God's not coming from heaven. Heaven's already been deposited on the inside of you. Do you receive this today? Yes. Say it out loud. I do receive. I do receive. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Come on. Shout a praise to the Lord. Amen. 